Xinjiang's capital already on lockdown for 40 days. A local resident tells us the extent of the virus protection measures. Now opening the front door is considered a crime. A new report says China plans to launch an ambitious policy for vaccine diplomacy. It's already announced collaborating with Pakistan and plans to cover nearly half the world's population. A U.S. Navy missile destroyer conducted operations near the Paracel Islands today. That's after China reportedly filed four missiles near the disputed island. Part two of our interview with a Chinese whistleblower. In the early stage of the outbreak, he helped the local Chinese government snap up the world's masks. Now he's accusing the regime of intentionally creating a global supply shortage. And Elon Musk's SpaceX contract with NASA might be in jeopardy. U.S. lawmakers are questioning if Tesla's ties to China could jeopardize national security. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. The capital city of China's Xinjiang region has remained under lockdown for 40 days. In some neighborhoods inside the city, called Urumqi, residents' doors have even been blocked off and sealed shut with iron nails. Local resident Ms. Wang described the situation to us. We gave her a pseudonym to protect her identity. She explained that simply opening the front door is now considered a crime adding that people dare not protest. Just two days ago, someone opened their door and then was taken away. The common people are timid and fearful. Who wants to take the lead to protest? Nobody. People are all submissive. She told us that citizens there are scared because the Chinese Communist Party or CCP's means of preserving its control have always been strict. People maintaining so-called safety here in Xinjiang, people were sent to detention centers or training centers for two or three years. Then they were being sentenced, but even after the sentence ended, they won't let them go. Wang also described the hardships people there are facing after nearly half a year without work. Suddenly, all of us were out of work. The financial burden has been really heavy. There are many people who cannot bear the pressure. Some had to spend all their savings to cover their costs. Many people count on their wages and don't have much savings. The epidemic has been churning for over half a year. Since then, I haven't been back to work. She noted that the prices of common goods and foods have also skyrocketed. It used to cost about four U.S. dollars to buy a chicken. Now it's about nine dollars. Before the epidemic, before the city's lockdown, watermelons in Xinjiang had dropped to about 10 cents per two-pound melon. But since the city's closure began, it has now risen to about 50 cents. That's as the Chinese regime managed to earn money as a result of the lockdown. At that time, watermelons were still in the fields. Farmers couldn't sell them. They were going to rot in the fields. The authorities sent cars to farmers to collect the melons for free. Who got all the money? Who does the supermarket even serve? State-run enterprises are also taking advantage of the situation, while private companies continue to suffer. Only China's postal service does not stop. What do you call this? It's not fair that China Post can have a monopoly just because it's a state enterprise. Though amid the turmoil, Wang said not everyone is suffering. According to her, Communist Party officials and cadres aren't enduring the same difficulties as people in the lower classes. Many large supermarkets are still open, but common people can't go. Only those from community management and the leading cadres can. The supermarkets remain open for them. They are living a normal life. Now we look to China's virus measures on a broader national scale. On the heels of its controversial mask diplomacy, the CCP is starting to launch an ambitious policy for vaccine diplomacy. The Chinese regime's promises to prioritize vaccine supplies for certain countries now cover nearly half of the world's population. According to Wall Street Journal, China and Pakistan will collaborate on conducting clinical trials of China's vaccine. Later, Pakistan will receive enough doses during early distribution to vaccinate about one-fifth of its population. 
Other similar promises have been made to Afghanistan and some African countries. China's Premier Li Keqiang also promised priority to five countries alongside the Mekong River, including Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia and Vietnam. Vaccine distribution also involves the South China Sea dispute. Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte promised China that U.S. Army members will not return to bases in the country in exchange for vaccine supplies. So far, Beijing has agreed to think about prioritizing the needs of the Philippines. That's as many other countries are involved in China's phase three human trials. Among them are Mexico, the United Arab Emirates, Argentina, Peru, Morocco and Brazil. All of them will also be on the priority list. U.S.-based China affairs analyst Li Lingyi says China doesn't have the capacity to produce such a large supply. Adding that Beijing's promises are merely an effort to unite countries against the United States and other Western countries. Vaccine development is a science and must follow a standard development process for approval. Dr. Sean Lin, a former U.S. Army virology researcher, expressed his concerns to the Epic Times. He said it's troublesome when Beijing mentions strategic needs because it means Beijing takes political factors as the priority. Slogans have always been a way of delivering CCP propaganda, carrying its policies and ideology, and a tool to control people. Here, we will show you some slogans found in China during the pandemic. Reading Chinese slogans is like flipping through a history book of the communist regime's rule over China. This phenomenon hasn't changed much, and the meanings behind them stay the same. As the CCP virus swept through China, the growing intensity of the situation alerted everyone. Slogans found their way to all corners of Chinese society. The CCP's leadership is always the top priority. For example, a slogan on a banner stands out and circulates online. It says coronavirus is not scary as long as everyone listens to the CCP. And the regime takes every chance to apply its conflict theory to its people. It encourages Chinese people to divide and fight against each other. Many banners carry this ideology. For example, there were widespread closures of businesses during the pandemic. And a slogan says, any businesses that start early are the class enemies lurking among the people. Another shows no shame in its open discrimination. A banner made by local community-level government says everyone who comes back from Hubei is a time bomb. Hubei is the province where Wuhan is located. They even take brutality as a good thing and put up this banner. If you go outside, we'll break your leg. If you talk back, we'll knock your teeth out. Not only did they put up this banner, but some government workers even patrolled around the community, repeatedly shouting out the very same thing through a speaker. There is an idiom that says, if the upper beam is not straight, the lower beam will be crooked. The next made-up slogan from a town hall is an example that follows this idea. It casts a curse on anyone who tries to conceal that they have the virus. If anyone tries to hide it and does not self-quarantine, you must die without sons. Recently, a slogan along these lines was found in the center area of Beijing, and the picture went viral. Many were shocked, with one netizen calling it Cultural Revolution 2.0. The slogan says, the best way to protect yourself and perform mass prevention and mass control is to report on each other. This slogan is made by the local CCP committee propaganda department. A netizen commented, the CCP has been dividing the people's mutual trust and cohesion and mobilizing the masses to fight the masses. That is the CCP's most despicable tactic. Reporting by Xu Wenhui, NTD News. In part one of this special report, we presented the exclusive story of a Chinese whistleblower who unknowingly helped the regime's authorities acquire medical supplies. He thought they were headed to China as donations to combat the virus, but later discovered officials were selling them for profit. Today, we give you the second part of the story, how China created a global mask shortage, and if you ask Jiang Tianyong how it was intentional. Back in January and February, Jiang Pengyun used his global business connections to source masks for local Chinese agencies. I was purchasing medical supplies from Vietnam, Indonesia, Russia. And in March, all of these countries experienced different degrees of mask shortages. 
In developed countries, there are so many local pro-Beijing organizations, so at the time those countries' masks were all snatched up by such organizations. The ones that still had some left, one is Mexico. But you have to use flights to transport them to China. At the time, Alibaba helped coordinate the flights. Jiang also managed to get one country to produce supplies for China. The Malaysia government, they agreed to start emergency mass production for China. But there was a problem. It would be impossible for Malaysia to source an essential material used to produce surgical and N95 masks. It's called melt-blown non-woven fabric. That's the material that helps filter bacteria and viruses. Without it, the mask would be no different than a piece of cloth and wouldn't meet hospital standard. China is the world's largest producer and exporter of non-woven fabric. And according to Chinese media report, Xiantao City inside Wuhan province alone account for one quarter of worldwide production of the material. But then something strange happened. On February 3rd, city officials in Xiantao shut down all but 10 non-woven fabric factories. There are over 200 of them in the city. That was at a time when protective gear was in such short supply that frontline workers in Chinese hospitals were seen using plastic office folders to protect themselves. Officials claim they opened more factories later, but locals told media that the majority of the factories remain idle. Chinese media outlets cited concerns over infection among workers as a reason for the shutdowns, but Jiang disagreed. What's really weird is, the Chinese government did not agree to export the raw material to produce non-woven fabric to these countries either. That is to say, China is not in short of masks. What they wanted was other countries' supply of N95 masks that were meant for medical workers. He said the Chinese authorities created the shortage on purpose. China just wants to monopolize these N95 masks throughout the world. Later, your doctors won't be able to help infected patients due to lack of protective gear, and it will accelerate the spread of the virus in your country. At that time, you'll need to look to China for help and buy the masks you once donated at a high price. This is the regime's most vicious trick. Then, Jiang said, China would have the leverage to ask for political favors from other countries in exchange for masks. That way, the regime could further expand its global influence. You'd have to recognize China's leadership. You'd have to be China's subordinate. You'd have to agree there is only one China. You'd have to approve of our propaganda. You'd have to install Huawei in your network. You'd have to provide all local information to Huawei's equipment. This is just like the One Belt, One Road initiative. The CCP would impose political requirements to control other countries. Jiang's story is in line with an accusation made by White House advisor Peter Navarro back in April. China was basically attempting to corner the market in personal protective equipment, including masks. So they were buying large quantities of masks, gloves, goggles, respirators from the rest of the world at a time when the world was still sleeping with respect to the dangers uh, of the virus. Jiang said Huang Zhongnan, the person that contacted him to buy supplies for local Chinese agencies, also shared other information. According to Jiang, Huang once told him that Chinese company Alibaba played a leading role in coordinating the buy-up of global supplies and helped import them to China in the outbreak's early days. The Chinese tech giants later made high-profile mask donations to 150 countries, including the U.S. and Europe. Stay tuned for the final segment of this special report tomorrow, how the regime threatened Jiang against publicizing the secret operation and why he chose to do it anyway. Reporting by Xiao Hua Gu and Penny Zhou, NTD News. A Chinese city recently announced a major step forward against organized crime by investigating and arresting 19 of its own police officers. Their crimes attracted extra public attention. In China's northeast city Harbin of the Heilongjiang province, the Public Security Bureau recently announced a list of crimes, allegedly committed by 19 of its own members, including several police officers at the department level. Their crimes include organizing prostitution, setting up casinos, taking drugs, embezzling and accepting bribes, colluding with gangs, organizing mafia groups for extortion and acting as protective umbrellas of evil forces. 
Chinese netizens were shocked by the list and ridiculed the police, saying that they had completely rounded out almost all of the crimes of the underworld. China state-run newspaper Beijing Youth Daily reported that these 19 people may be related to Zhen Reichen, a senior Communist Party official who was removed from his post last summer. Zhen was the head of the Harbin Public Security Bureau for eight years, before becoming head of the city's political commission. This is not the first case of its kind in the police system in this city, and not the biggest case either. In 2018, 122 officials in Harbin Public Security Traffic Police System were identified as protective umbrellas for the crazy truck fleets. These cargo trucks were driving while overloaded during no truck times, often speeding and ignoring traffic rules. But after they bribed police officers, they would be released, exempted from punishment, and their record of violations would be eliminated. The trucks that paid so-called protection fees would have a certain sign on the truck and would have no problem with any traffic police, whatever they did. Renowned Chinese dissident Huang Qi has been serving a 12-year sentence since 2016. For the last four years, his 87-year-old mother, Pu Wenqing, was not allowed to see him. Now she's not even allowed to talk to her son on the phone. Pu is a late-stage cancer patient. She says she hopes to see her son one last time. One human rights group called the Huang Qi Group of Friends and Family has taken a special interest in the case. Its members have initiated a call to the prison in Sichuan province where Huang Qi is being detained and demanded that authorities allow Huang to meet or talk with his mother. The group currently has over 20 members. They now take turns calling the prison daily. Wang Jing, a member of the group, explained that many members are people who have been mistreated by authorities and who have benefited from Huang Qi's help. Our initial appeal was, of course, to ask the authorities to release Huang Qi and announce that he's not guilty. If he can't be released, he should be given the basic right to meet and talk with his mother. This is the most basic right as a prisoner. Gu Guoping, another group member, expressed hope that their efforts to help Huang will play a role in promoting the rule of law in China. This can spark people's awareness of social citizenship and the rule of law. The Chinese regime is not abiding by its own laws and regulations. Huang Qi has long fought for the rights and interests of 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre victims, as well as those who suffered through the Great Sichuan Earthquake of 2008. So far, he's been detained for a total of 10 years in over three different instances. Now he's serving a 12-year prison sentence for what officials call leaking state secrets and the illegal provision of state secrets abroad. That's after he revealed details about China's human rights abuses to overseas media. A human rights lawyer who had to flee to China spoke at the Republican National Convention last night. He says the Chinese Communist Party beat and imprisoned him after he spoke out against their one-child policy. He's calling on the U.S. to gather a coalition of other democracies to stop the CCP's aggression. NTD's Kevin Hogan has more. Standing up to tyranny is not easy, I know. Chen Guangcheng knows the tyranny of the Chinese Communist Party firsthand. He is a human rights lawyer and activist. In 2006, he was sentenced to four years in prison and later house arrest after filing a class action lawsuit against local authorities for excessive enforcement of the one-child policy. When I spoke out against China's one-child policy and other injustices, I was prosecuted, beaten, sent to prison, and put under house arrest by the Chinese Communist Party. Beijing instituted the one-child policy in 1979. Families that didn't comply were subjected to heavy fines, forced abortions, and sterilization. China's communist regime has persecuted millions of people of faith, including Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, and Falun Gong practitioners, tens of thousands of whom have been thrown into prison brainwashing centers and forced labor camps. The CCP is an enemy of humanity. It is terrorizing its own people, and it is threatening the well-being of the world. 
Chen went on to say that expressing beliefs on religion, democracy and human rights that the CCP doesn't approve of can lead to prison. In an exclusive interview with NTD, he said many Chinese citizens are in prison right now for criticizing the CCP on social media sites like Weibo. He said we should stand behind people who have taken action to confront the Chinese regime. Standing up to fight unfairness isn't easy, I know. So there's President Trump, but he has shown the courage to wage that fight. We need to support, vote, and fight for President Trump for the sake of the world. In 2012, Chen escaped house arrest and took refuge at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. He said he is grateful to the U.S. for welcoming him and his family to this country where they are now free. He said President Trump has been a leader in standing up to the Chinese Communist regime and that we need other countries to join the fight. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. Elon Musk's SpaceX contract with NASA might be in jeopardy. That's after concerns of possible national security risks posed by Chinese financial support for Musk's electric car company Tesla. U.S. lawmakers are questioning if NASA contracts with Tesla could jeopardize national security. Tesla dominates the electric car market in China. New data released shows Tesla surpassed the three best-selling electric vehicles combined in China during the month of July. Senator Cory Gardner expressed his concern to Washington Examiner, saying what worries him is that companies in China could come into the U.S., make a sweetheart deal, take sensitive information, take proprietary technologies and use it to enrich their own space program, their own national security efforts in China. Gardner also serves as a chair on the Foreign Relations Subcommittee for East Asia. To combat that risk, he proposed two amendments. Firstly, to have the Government Accountability Office review NASA contractors for any possible ties to China. Secondly, to remind NASA leaders to be aware of those ties when awarding contracts. He called the number of companies expressing concern over the issue in the U.S. as alarming. One such company that could suffer under the new law is SpaceX. The space exploration company recently struck a deal with Chinese banks to take out a loan worth $1.4 billion. Sources familiar with the matter told Reuters the loan is for Tesla's Shanghai plant and will last five years. Aside from SpaceX, there are at least seven other aerospace companies with some kind of Chinese investment that would raise red flags. A Senate Republican aide told the Washington Examiner that Chinese developer Tencent is one of them. According to the report, some lawmakers are concerned the law is too broad and would be too hard to enforce. To counter that, they suggest a compromise to establish a self-certification process for companies to affirm that no Chinese entity is even a minority owner. The U.S. Navy is making an unusual move this Thursday. Its guided missile destroyer conducted operations near the contested Parasol Islands. That's after China fired four missiles into the South China Sea. NTD's Juliet Song reports. A U.S. guided missile destroyer, U.S. Mustin, conducted operations near the disputed Parasol Islands this Thursday. The Navy's chief of information retweeted a post from a reporter. It says the U.S. has once again challenged Chinese claims to the waters surrounding the Parasil Islands in the South China Sea. The move comes after China reportedly fired four ballistic missiles into the South China Sea this Wednesday. China fired the missiles after accusing a U.S. spy plane of trespassing. China said the spy plane flew into an area that it deems as off-limits. But the U.S. military responded that the flight was within accepted international rules and regulations. The Chinese missiles avoided sensitive targets like Guam or the disputed Parasil Islands, but reportedly landed in an area between China's Hainan province and the Parasil Islands. An expert told Bloomberg that Beijing's move is not directly challenging the United States. He said Beijing was careful to do it within acceptable limits, firing into undisputed waters off the southern coast with due notice. A U.S. Navy vice admiral said the United States won't be intimidated by the Chinese missiles. He said, in terms of launching ballistic missiles, the U.S. Navy has 38 ships underway today in the Indo-Pacific region, including in the South China Sea. 
adding, and we continue to fly, sail, and operate anywhere international laws allow us to demonstrate our commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific and reassure our allies and partners. U.S. Secretary of Defense Mark Esper is calling on nations to counter China in the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, we're not going to cede uh, this region, we're not going to cede uh, an, an, an inch of ground, if you will, to uh, another country, any other country that thinks that uh, their form of government, their views uh, on human rights, their views on sovereignty, their views on freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, all those things, uh, that somehow that's better uh, than what many of us share. The United States also imposed sanctions on Chinese companies that helped Chinese military construct and militarize artificial islands in the South China Sea. Its first such sanctions move against Beijing over the disputed strategic waterway. Reporting by Juliet Song, NTD News. The U.S. Secretary of Defense says Beijing keeps breaking its promises to the rest of the world. And smaller countries are especially feeling the pressure. U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper says China has not lived up to its promises to abide by international law, rules and norms. Esper, speaking in Hawaii before a regional tour, said Beijing has repeatedly fallen short of its promises. Our like-minded partners around the world are experiencing the CCP's systematic rule-breaking behavior, debt-backed economic coercion and other malign activities meant to undermine the free and open order that has benefited nations of all sizes. China included. He says China is concentrating its bad behavior in the South China Sea, and that's where the Association of Southeast Asian Nations will play an important role in the future. We see Southeast Asia, particularly in the South China Sea area, is where China seems to be flexing its muscles the most and uh, conducting some of its worst behavior. He said although the Indo-Pacific is the epicenter of the power competition, it's actually a global competition. And the U.S. has to be able to deal with China wherever they are. Esper says the hand of Beijing is heavier on smaller countries. They feel that coercion. They see the bullying that is happening out there. And, um, and, and they recognize the important role that the United States plays in this emerging, evolving great power competition. And they want to be part of a team on his tour, Esper will also visit Palau, a small pro-American nation southeast of the Philippines. In a recent column published in the Wall Street Journal, Esper urged all countries to examine and consider curtailing their relationship with Beijing's military to, quote, make sure they're not helping advance the Communist Party's malign agenda towards our collective detriment. And that's all for today's China In Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.